the Institute for having me here. Um, it's an honor to be um, here and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to make this film because um, I had made some films before but it's not easy to make independent films in Thailand and I wasn't I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to make any more um, and then I was asked uh, to present something here and that gave me the opportunity to to make this film so thank you Tash also for inviting me and initiating this project um, and yes thank you everybody to be it's, it's so nice to be in a foreign country and people showing up to, to see your work. So, thank you. Thank you, Prabhna. Uh, I'm just uh, very happy to be here and to moderate this session with you. My name is uh, Richard Verly. I'm presently, as Tash said previously, the correspondent for France for the Swiss Daily Le Temps. But it happens that in the past, for a few years, for around eight years altogether, I was correspondent in Thailand. That was back in the 90s. But I keep coming back and forth with Thailand, and we just talked about Thailand uh, before the opening of the session. I think it would be interesting, though, as Tash mentioned in a few words, the history of this project. But personally, I do not know much more about the project. So if you could tell us how come, how this idea of uh, linking satellite observation, the past, unwanted past, fortune teller, and so on. How did this project came on? And maybe a little bit more on, was there an idea at the beginning? What was the request that you answered? Um, there wasn't a particular request. Um, and as usually uh, the way things happen with me, I always forget how things started. But um, <laughs> it's gone through so many, many uh, things along the way. But uh, when I was approached, um, to come here and to present something, I was uh, already doing research on um, Thai history for my own work, from possibly maybe a novel or uh, another film project. Um, so I knew that I wanted to do something related to history, uh, specifically the political history in Thailand. And um, coincidentally, France is, France, especially Paris, plays quite an a important role in Thai political history um, because in 1927, um, Paris was the place where seven young Thai students who were studying here uh, had a secret meeting in the hotel room um, on the... Number nine, Rue du Samarat. Near, nearby, yes. And it was when they planned to uh, stage a democratic revolution in Thailand. Um, these seven students became very important in Thai politics later on. And they did uh, staged the coup. Uh, it was a military coup in order to overthrow the absolute monarchy uh, that we had then, and the country what at the time still called Siam, um, under the reign of King Rama VII. Um, so it was here that the, the ideas came about for Thai democracy. Um, and I thought that was an interesting uh, historical fact to deal with, but along the way I found that, um, I, I don't know, for some reason when I start to to think that what I'm going to do is a political work, I lose interest immediately. <laughs> it's just my taste because I, I feel that there are other ways to, to convey messages uh, about politics or culture or uh, society without having to really address directly the, the politics. Um, and there are other interesting historical facts about Thailand and France. For example, uh, in 1686, 
uh, King Narai, the great of, uh, of the Ayutthaya kingdom, sent his uh, diplomat, Gosapan, here to, to France in order to uh, have the second Thai embassy, I believe. <clears throat> And when he, when he and his entourage paid respect to Louis the Fourteenth, they they gave gifts to him, a bunch of exotic gifts from Siam, and two of those were small cannons um, made in the Thai style and decorate, decorated with the Thai uh, Siamese patterns, and it is believed that these two cannons were used as the main weapons by the mob uh, during the fall of the Bastille. So, I don't know if it's true, but I mean, uh, usually the, the, it's out there, the, the material, and a lot of people believe that it is true. I don't know if, if the records are reliable, but... Well, I personally never heard of it, but <laughs> did anyone heard about the Bastille being taken thanks to Thai artillery? I like to think that's, that it's true. That's, that's a piece of news. That's a piece of news. <laughs> yes, yeah, they, they yeah, are true. That that's true. And it is alleged that 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 the, that the mob were looking for weapons during that time, and none of them worked except for these two Siamese cannons for some reason. They are very beautiful. True. <laughs> True. But I thought that was interesting, and I, I wanted to kind of use that, but, um, but then I wanted to also find something more recent. Okay. And, and, and then I found out about the satellite that was developed here in France um, by Airbus, or now known as Airbus. Um, and, and, I, and I thought that the idea of writing something based on this satellite was appealing because uh, it gave me the opportunity to have like sci-fi elements and a surrealistic elements to the, to the narrative. So I decided to go with that. Um, and it sort of represents the condition of uh, Thailand and how people have to live under this sort of helpless um, way of living where you can't really, there, 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 there's no system of uh, real checks and balances when it comes to the decision made by the government or the spending that they do. And they spend a lot of money on this kind of thing. Um, for no real urgency for the people, you know, and um, and I don't know if you know this, but recently Bangkok has been experiencing bad pollution, um, and according to the official statement about the satellite, it was supposed to detect pollution and help Thailand somehow, um, you know. Uh, prevent this pollution from happening. So when when the pollution happened recently, I was really waiting to hear in the news that this satellite somehow was detecting this. And, and but weeks later, there was a small news uh, in the news saying that the satellite confirmed that there is pollution. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't, I don't think you need, you know, like billions of dollars to <laughs> send something into space to say that. But, um, but yeah, so, so to me it represents that also, how, how pe Thai people live under this sort of helplessness that we're experiencing. It happens that the two um, historic episodes that you mentioned, actually that the young lady is finding out when she look at the prince, mm -hmm. those are related to two kings who were directly confronted with the West. Yes. So you have King Narai, who was the first one to receive the embassy from Louis XIV, and you have King Mongkut, who was the father of Rama V, who was the yes. great modernizer of Thailand, but he, he also opened, opened his palace to the famous Anna Leonowens, yes. who, who came in and was the tutor 
of yes. King Rama V. So that's that's very interesting. Do you believe at the moment? I mean, you all understand if you're familiar with the political situation in Thailand that the country is at the moment under a military regime. It has been the case for the last four years. They are expecting a national election on the 24th of March. Of March. 24th yes. of March. Do you believe that um, these military, let's say, the, the powers in place in Thailand do have a problem in with the past and with history. Yeah. Because there is this word in your title which is unwanted past. Yes. So is there a part of the past that they don't want to hear about? Yes, definitely. Because, I mean, and not only this military government, but in the past, all through, as far as I can remember, um, there is the official history of Thailand that people study and it's pretty much propaganda because they don't tell you the things that they don't want you to know or to remember. So there is that censorship always in, in Thai culture and society. Um, a lot of the, the events that happen in history, very important ones and very, very significant in terms of how um, Thai society became Thai society today are never mentioned. So, be, because um, a lot of them, if they were mentioned, would probably make people be more critical of the authorities that are in power or question their own past and um, question the main, the, the basic symbols that are supposed to be the image of uh, Thailand, uh, namely the nation and religion. And when we, when we say religion in Thailand, we also mean Buddhism. It's not just any religion. And uh, the monarchy. So they don't want people to question any of, any of that. But um, I, I think that as people live in a more modern world, it's really hard to suppress uh, all that forever, so it's, it's slowly coming out. Um, and we basically now, we, li we live in as a result of those suppressions in the past. The, the fact is, you're, when, you, when you did that documentary or the, the film, uh, in a way you predicted the future, because recently in Thailand, the monument one of the monuments which was commemorating yes. the coup by these seven yes. persons in Paris disappeared overnight. Yes. It was, it was already displaced. It used to be in the center of Bangkok and then it was moved several years ago yeah. in a suburb, in a northern suburb of Bangkok, and it disappeared overnight. Actually, two, two things disappeared. Before that, the, a plaque that said that this was the spot where um, the military, the, the coup took place to overthrow the monarchy was there, that was also taken out and put in with another plaque that said, you know, a different message on it. So, um, yeah, so things like that happen <laughs> still in, in Thailand, in Bangkok. Um, and as it happens today, there is development that's very, I don't know if it's exciting or worrying, worrying in Thailand also that um, one of the main parties that are going to be in the election will announce that the, the prin princess, the, the older sister of the, of the king, of the current king, will run as a candidate. <laughs> really? Yes. Okay. So. I think it's true, but I don't know. we have to wait. And, and Another thing that we have in, the, in your film is the importance of fortune teller. Yes. So I'd like to hear more about that because this is present also in Malaysian culture, in other culture in the region. Mm. Uh, is it still very important for normal people and also, I understand, for politicians? For almost everybody, because it's, uh, this is something that I, that I think is a very important issue and it cannot be dealt with lightly because it means a lot to many people and what people don't realize is that sometimes, but this, this belief in astrology, in, in superstition, go all the way up to the top. It's not just the common people, you know. So there are companies who would hi hire people according not to their qualifications or competence, but on their star sign. So they have the companies 
in-house astrologer, you know, look at the applications and say, oh, this person should work with us because he, his sign is good, you know, that kind of thing. And it's, it's quite, um, I don't know, incredible that that kind of thing is hap still happening in this day and age, but it's really true. And people will depend, uh, the government, the, the politicians, they, they consult fortune tellers, they, they do things according to what their fortune tellers tell them. Um, they are very famous fortune tellers that people know, you know, that uh, uh, they are the consult, uh, they are the, what do you call it? The, yeah, I mean, people go to, important people go to them for adv advice. And how would you explain that in, in, in I wish I knew contemporary society? <laughs> yeah, I mean... I, because you're, you're from a journalist family. Yes. It happens by chance that I know your dad, who was the founder of a leading English newspaper. So, I mean, I guess in two days in modern time, you should not rely on fortune tellers. Of course So why not, do people still believe in them? Um, Yes, and this is an issue that I find interesting because as a secular, uh, sci more scientific-minded person that I am, I, I, I used to sort of dismiss it and feel like it's just something like a residue from the past. Um, but I realize now that you have to sort of be more sensitive uh, with this issue because it is so important in in many people's lives in Thailand and for example my own mother uh, likes to see fortune fortune tellers she's taken me a couple of times um, so it's not I don't think I, I think it's even more important of an issue in Thailand than the partisanship in politics or the polarization that we are seeing now because it's something bad that unites everybody. Everybody from all sides believe in <laughs> superstition and, and and astrology, you know. So it, uh, it has a lot of influence in Thai society that I think we need to um, look at it with uh, sensitivity and, and, and not only with reason, but with sensitivity also to understand how to deal with it. One last question, maybe before handing over the microphone to the audience. Uh, the fact of the matter is the way you portray the military mm. in your film. Yeah. Uh, clearly, they have a strong authority, the guy behind the phone, but in the meantime, you don't take them very seriously. They look quite, I would say, relaxed military rulers. You could have, you could have presented them with weapons in a very much tougher way than what you did. So does it mean that in Thailand you invented the soft military dictatorship? Soft? Um, soft sounds better <laughs> than how I would address. I think it's more like uh, stupid. Yeah, I think that's the more more accurate word. It's because they they um, I mean they are dictatorship, but it's not not in a very intelligent way, let's say. It's, it's what they, how they deal with things, what they do, uh, what they know, uh, it's just not uh, to, like, it's not in, a, in an intellectual level, you know. It's, uh, and day to, day to day, it can be different. Sometimes they say very stupid things. Uh, sometimes they're sort of afraid of the reaction of the people, so they, they tone it down a little bit. I mean, they, they sort of, I mean, gone are the days that, you know, you have respectable, intelligent military generals so it's it's just it's just now force and uh, i don't know not very logical i think there is a microphone there in the back of the room so we take questions with pleasure if there are any questions on the film on thailand uh, on the writer and maybe on the project as well yes No one or oh, oh. Oh, criticism. <laughs>
Um, Prabhda, thank you for wonderful film. Oh, thank thank, thank you. you for uh, leading this conversation. I have one question for both of you because you, know, you obviously have different insights into, into Thailand. How do you explain the fact that what you've just been, you've been talking about, the way Thai people live, the way Thai society is run, is totally contrary to what most people think about Thailand. So what, that's one of the most interesting things to me about Thailand is that it's probably one of the most attractive countries on the surface to anyone, to, to, for, to foreigners especially. They're actually, once you start to get to know it, the problems are so deep-seated. How do you explain the fact that Thailand is still able to keep these two elements sort of side by side? And the, the, the question is, you know, for, for bo both of you, because Rishal, you, you have a different perspective on this. Um, I often wish that I was a, a tourist or a foreigner living in Thailand because I would enjoy it a lot more. And because I know, I mean, I, mean, I was um, away from Thailand for a long time. I studied in the States. And when I went back, I was kind of a, a tourist. And I was kind of an, I was, an outsider still because I didn't uh, have uh, I didn't have friends. I had to you know like relearn a lot of things again. So I did have a brief period of knowing how it's like to be to have like a foreigner's eye towards Thailand and th th Thai society. It's quite an exciting place. Uh, it's also nice because. The food is great, and um, you know, like all the all the uh, tourist uh, locations are really nice. The beaches are beautiful, and and I understand all that because you know they are. I mean, I mean there is truth in in that, um, and Thai people are very accommodating to foreigners. Also, and they're happy to help, and they're very smiley because most of the time because they can't speak English, but. Um, <laughs> but uh, but I think it's also maybe true with a lot of places that is not your your house or your home that you don't really understand the, the problems underneath the surface because you're not there long enough or you. Um, prefer not to know about them or you or you sort of consider the people who are um, saying negative things and are just like the minority not not the, which is maybe too true also I have to say um, but yeah I, we, we don't go to a foreign country and feeling uh, sympathetic towards how they are being repressed by the government, or you know how 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 some minority groups are being treated. But all these things happen in in Thailand, and and maybe also true that it, it happens in such a way that is so subtle um, that even maybe people living there don't really realize or notice if they don't pay attention so much in that area. Well, um, clearly Prabhda um, answered partly the question when he said that this is part of Thai mentality. I mean, there is genuinely, I believe, in the Thai people mindset, this idea that you welcome the visitor. Mm -hmm. You make the visitor comfortable and you have the chance of relying on the great food mm -hmm. and, 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 and very good natural asset. So clearly there is a cultural thing there. You like, Thai people, I, I understand, uh, like comfortable life for themselves. Mm -hmm. Thai people like comfort. And the good thing is that they like people to be comfortable as well. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, and that goes back maybe in a way um, online with your film, it is also, and it has been for centuries, a political strategy. Mm -hmm. Thai rulers, most of them military or kings, have clearly understood that if you present a very nice face to the foreigners, and especially to the Westerners, you gain. You get influence through the very good, positive way that you present. And I think that's part of Thailand miracle in the way, political miracle, because First of all, we didn't say it, but we have to say it again. Thailand has never been colonized. And it's never been colonized clearly because 
it was right in the middle between the British colonial empire and the French colonial empire. So it was, in a way, the demarcation line, but also because it managed to convince both of them that it would apply their system without integrating their empire. And that's, I, I would say, and I take it very seriously as an asset and as a quality for the Thai people. They have managed for centuries to fool the Westerners with pleasure. <laughs> so it's, 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 they, they did it with a lot of delicacy. They did it with a lot of pleasure. They did it very nicely, but they've been fooling the Westerners, and it continues now. If you notice, the military regime in Thailand has been under some sanction, some sanction, but clearly, I mean, no Western government really thought of getting hard on that military government because whether or not you have military rulers in power in Thailand, the country remains nice and the people remain nice. And that's the way tourists see it and visitors see it. Yes. Am I right? Yes, I agree too. Yes. But, but w what I want to emphasize clearly is that it's a mixture, I believe, of a genuine character of the Thai people and a political strategy designed for century. And you could say the same for the image of Thai woman, which has been used by, by political rulers in Thailand. You know, the Thai woman being very soft, nice, uh, superb, Polite. pleasant. It's been politically used by regime, <laughs> really. So, so never be fooled by the Thai. They are smart. <laughs> Thank you, Prabhdo, for just a really interesting film. Um, I, I actually have a question on the heels of this remark. Um, I was fascinated by the young woman whom, who is at the center, and um, she's kind of a reserve, uh, reverse Cassandra, someone who sees into the past and not into the future. And I think the gender dynamics are very interesting in the film, and so Thailand through Weldbeck, for example, being known as a site of prostitution, a site for the sort of travel or sort of, you know, that, that kind of pleasure that has been promoted somewhat. Um, I was wondering whether you could just speak a little bit to the, to the gender um, tensions in your film and how that played out for you. Um, I, I, I haven't really thought about it much, but I tend to to use or to write about uh, female characters uh, quite often in my work, whether in film or in, or in literature. Um, and I think I'm just drawn towards that personally. I, I, don't, I don't think it's, I don't do it intentionally or consciously, particularly for any reason, apart from that I think it's, it, interest, it interests me to look through the eyes of a female character um, and it's a kind of challenge for me to do that, and I and I enjoy that. So sometimes I I get criticism about it because um, uh, I don't know. Usually from women, <laughs> maybe they think I don't I don't I'm not accurate in in portraying uh, the female character or gender, but. Um, but I don't know, it just comes naturally to me that uh, if I'm writing this story, this, the main character should be a woman, or, you know, that, that I, I don't know how to explain it, really. Uh, yep, well, many, many questions, please. Uh, sorry, Kap. Sorry, Kap. Uh, so my question uh, is directly related to the fact that we tend to forget about, about our past. And uh, for sure, the, the, the state and military governments of many eras have tried to suppress or uh, misrepresent history. But it's also uh, true that uh, the, the general population is also uh, are not, I would say, interested in learning about uh, pol Thai political history, the role, for example, of the, the monarchy before or after the Siamese revolution, all that. And to me, that seems to kind of, um, uh, it's one of the key causes of, or have some role in the political uh, conflicts today. And I'm wondering what's your take on um, how did it turn out to be that way? And if we are to fix this uh, 
maybe to make people more I don't know, interested in Thai history themselves. What's you, you mean why is it that people are not interested in, in yes in a way like well, he's uh, thai i think so he yes knows. i am yes i am like my my parents my parents or our parents generation grew up in an era that went through long went through violent political events yes and after i don't know after they turned uh, 45 50s they seem to forget about what has happened yes and um, mm. they seem to have switched their position somehow Oh, yes. And how, how do we explain this phenomenon? And my second question, just for now, is uh, it's kind of linked to, it's um, uh, f- based on yesterday news that will be confirmed by 6 a.m. St- tomorrow, mm-hmm. if it's true, the Thai political trajectory would take a very bizarre turn. Mm-hmm. What's your take on it? <laughs> Regarding the, 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 the eldest sister of the king. Yes. Um, yes. I, I mean, I don't want to generalize, but I, I feel that probably there is some truth in the fact that Thai people or the Thai society prefer to, to have fun, to, 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 to enjoy life than to um, ponder very serious things such as politics. But also that's not their fault because um, I don't think, like in Thai history, there was never any kind of um, training in, you know, in school or, or, in, or in daily life for critical thinking. And we are even told that critical thinking is somehow impolite or rude is to ask or to question their, your authority or your parents or your elders. So um, I think that's probably mainly the reason. Um, but also I think there's a sense of um, kind of hopelessness in, you know, even if you want to change society, I think living in Thailand and, and, and seeing how things turn out in the past, you feel sort of hopeless and, and you don't really know how to, to do it, how to begin, how to change. Um, like things that are happening now, you know, is, is, it's, it tends to go back in the loop, you know, like the same problems happening, but in a different way with different characters. Oh, by the way, some of the characters are still there, very old. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're still, you know, like people who, it's funny if you read these names of the politicians that are still playing a very important role in, Thai, in Thailand, and then you go back to, to see what they did before, like 50 years ago, 60 years ago, it's almost unimaginable that they're still there in, you know, in power and they have so much influence. Um, that would never happen in, you know, in more sensible countries, I think. But, uh, uh, but so this relates to your second question. I think it is, it, it, is, it sort of reflects the reality of Thai politics that the people who run the show are the elites still you know they they don't really care so much about the people they get together you know in their secret chamber and try to make deals you know like if you do this i'll give you that if you you know i think this is what's really happening behind the scene it's not really about democracy or giving people the right to vote again it's more about how do I come back to the country? How do, how do I get the money that I want without people knowing that I'm going to get the money? So it's, it's a lot of this um, behind the scene stuff. And, and I think it would be this, this new thing that's developing is quite serious because it's going to force the people who claim that they want democracy in Thailand to be silent because they they put in the position that they don't know what to do. They 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 can't really come out and say you know we are against having the princess as a candidate in the, in the election because then they would get a lot of trouble from the public. I think also 
um, is this problem that you know was never solved a long time ago and is is still creating problems for us in Thailand? And I do not think uh, I would disagree with you when you say Thai people are not interested by history. Uh, if you look at the success of historical movies, though the quality of the movie is not really good, you could say they are peplum movie. You know, you, they used to have that in Hollywood in the 50s, but still. People like those movies. There was this TV series recently, yes. uh, uh, huge with the costumes, history, and so on. Yes. So, so there is an interest in history. The problem is the offer. What is available? Yeah. I'm sure if more history would be available, Thai people would be interested. Yes. But it's just not available. And it's also mostly propaganda, as I was saying. That's that's right. Yeah. Uh, Thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm wondering to what degree you consider or hold tourism responsible for the continuation of human rights violations, or if, if the people continuation of of of, of, of uh, corruption or or drug trade or prostitution or human rights violations. We see this in many countries where the tourists, I think, in large part, know what's happening, but as you said, they're considered pleasure centers. So you know, let's go to Jamaica or Thailand or Cuba, even though we know that that's adding to, you know, we're giving our money toward things that we morally don't necessarily agree with. And on one hand, that is adding to the, the, the this lining the pockets of, of the people that are working, barely, but still. Is it worth that, to have the tourists come, knowing that it, it's sort of keeping those things the bad things, the immoral things, going. Yeah, I, I think it's ironic because, um, you know, the government, any government in Thailand always denies the, you know, popular uh, knowledge about Thailand through tourism. They always deny, they, they always, they don't like it when people mention that tourists come for, you know, sex, the sex industry, uh, you know, that kind of thing, but they benefit from it, so they keep it going, you know. Um, tourism is probably, at the moment, the only success in terms of uh, economy in, in Thailand. So when, when the government comes out and says, oh, the economy is doing really well, they mean tourism is doing well, the rest is not really doing well at all. Um, so it is a big problem, I think. But I think first the Thai people themselves also have to to admit to this uh, image or, or the reality that is happening in Thailand. Um, it's silly to deny this. And I think only when you face, you confront the, the problem, then you can start to somehow change it. Um, I, I, I watched a, a like a comedy series on Netflix just recently, and there's a, a Indian comedian uh, talking about how he's you know planning a vacation uh, with his friend, guy friends to come to Bangkok, and basically he's saying, "Oh, everybody knows why we're going to Bangkok. You know, <laughs> we don't have to say it because it's, everybody knows that we're going for the women, we're going for the drugs, we're going for the." So it's common knowledge everywhere in the world, except for <laughs> in Thailand, where, where people deny that this is happening. It's, it's really um, a problem. But at the same time, of, of course, uh, local people do benefit from tourism. Uh, I just feel that there should be a better way to, to, to have tourism and also um, to deal with those problems. Uh, I, first of all, thank you for the film. I found it very beautiful. Thank you. And I'm, I'm interested in artistically where you're going. And what struck me about the, about the film was the woman's capacity to sense another dimension because of her relationship to this technological advancement, which I think artificial intelligence and technology at its best will enable us to get deeper inside of our own imaginations. Yeah. And that was what I was struck by was that she was accessing some some other dimension of of human being alive, mm -hmm. 
And I'm curious if you're, if you, if you were, if this is the, if this is the end of the film and you were going to go on, or if it's going to continue. If is this a fixed thing, a, a finished film, or are you going to continue for it? this? Um, this particular film is is pretty fixed. Okay, so it's um, so it's done. But so I'm I'm interested in also in the relationship with the whole fortune teller thing because in a way fortune teller is like artificial, uh, you know, primitive artificial intelligence. Yes. And I'm interested if you could just talk a little bit about that. <laughs> um, well, it's, it's interesting in, in Thailand in the sense also that people think of it as a, as an, as a science. Some people do. They, they think astrology is basically learning about the stars and um, uh, numbers and, you know, it's, it has to do with math <laughs> somehow also. Um, so there are a variety of views on, on astrology and superstition and all that stuff in, in Thailand. And, and I think it's very interesting in itself to, to explore in terms of creativity. Um, I, I'm not, I mean, if I would, if I paid more interest uh, in it, it would not be because I'm interested in astrology or, or that kind of thing, but I'm interested in how people actually are and what they use uh, to sort of cope with life uh, in daily life in Thailand. Yeah, maybe I, can, maybe I didn't frame it quite right. Yes. I'm actually interested in, in that character, in her ability to access that other dimension because of technology. Is that something that you think that you will continue to work with in, in films? I, I think so. I'm, I'm currently uh, working on um, an idea for a novel that has to do with uh, game development, but, but a game that would enable the pers the player to uh, become an elephant um, <laughs> in the t sort of like uh, wildlife uh, trafficking problem in Thailand and, and with dealing with elephants and the elephant hunter you you can play you can be an elephant hunter and or the elephant in that situation so i'm kind of interested in in the idea in uh, in intelligence and also consciousness so i'm i'm doing a lot of research on consciousness also if you are interested on uh, fortune tellers in Southeast Asia, there is this excellent book of uh, the late journalist Tiziano Tozzani, which is called A Fortune Teller Told Me. In French, it's Un Devin Madi. I saw, I think it was published first Maison Neuve et la Rose and maybe reprinted by another uh, French publishing house. But uh, look at on the internet, Tiziano Tozzani, Fortune Teller. He was a German, he was an Italian journalist writing for the Spiegel German magazine. And for one year, I think it was in 92, 93, if I'm correct, he decided to travel throughout Southeast Asia. At that time, he was based in Bangkok without taking the plane. So he traveled only on foot or by train or by car. And all long away, I will all the way, all the places he went, he decided to consult Fortune Teller. And the reason why he wrote this book is because a uh, few months, I think, beginning of 92 or 93, before going to Cambodia, at that time there was a huge UN peacekeeping mission in Cambodia, mm. he went to see a fortune teller. The fortune teller told him, don't take any plane. So he decided to follow that advice, and one month later, the helicopter he was supposed to be in crashed in Cambodia. <laughs> yes, we, we hear. <laughs> Uh, I have two, two questions. One is related to the film uh, about the, the character, the boss. Yes. Um, in the end, can you tell us a little bit what message you the, wanted the to boss, say? The boss. Her of, boss. Or? Her boss, yes. Her boss. Um, well, f to me, he's a, quite a typical Thai character in... in that kind of position where he has authority, but not really real authority. You know, there is something above him that that has more authority. So he is just sort of a 
person doing his job, not really passionate about it, but he's just, you know, doing his duty. He doesn't really pay attention to, uh, he doesn't get any deeper to the, what he's doing, you know, so he spends a lot of time watching YouTube videos rather than, you know, researching what, what, he, what he does. Um, and he is not uh, strong enough to protect uh, her when, when coward? she... Coward? Is, uh, is he a coward? Yes, but I think sometimes, like in Thailand, when you're in that position, you're you don't even think about it. You sort of you go along with the way people um, are discriminated, and you just watch. You know, so passive. <laughs> and, and and the second question is um, uh, about what you said earlier about the lack of critical thinking. Yes. Um, is this, uh, how do you explain this? Is, it, is this education? Is this culture? Is it this tradition? And is it something that you find in other countries of Southeast Asia? Um, it's a very successful result of propaganda, I think. And it is my personal opinion. But it's propaganda through many means, also including religion. Because in, in Thailand, the kind of Buddhism that we believe in is that you are who you are today because of something you did in your past life. So if you were born poor in this life, it was your fault. It's not, you know, it's not the government fault, it's not other people, it's not your parents' fault, it's your fault. Because in your past life, maybe you killed somebody or, or you did something terrible. So how to get, become better is not doesn't have anything to do with this life. You, you, you have to do good things so that your next life, you will be born a better person, you will be born a boss, you will be born, you know, with a higher position in, in your work. So I think it's this mentality that a lot of people do believe this. So it, it, they're not so concerned about the present. They, you know, they, they're not concerned about how to make life better, how to make society better. They're, they're too busy thinking about, you know, what happens after they die and their next life will be, whether it will be better or worse. Yeah, plus, plus the fact, I think, that um, it doesn't pay off to show that you have a critical thinking and a critical yes. set of mind. It, it doesn't makes pay life off. very tough. Uh, it doesn't pay off not only, I would say, politically or economically in terms of a job, but even it doesn't pay off in terms of friends because yes. you are annoying people yes, you're yes, going yes. out with. Yes, exactly. And you have in Thai this word which you have to know, which is Kleng Chai. Great. So you yeah. don't want to offend, mm. I mean, you may translate it better than I do, but you don't want to offend the person you are with by asking questions that he may not like. So then, you see, you never want to be yourself in a position where you disrupt the harmony around you. So that, that's really difficult to have in that context a critical sense of mind and the, let's say the will to come on with a disruptive argument, yes, for example. Exactly, yes. Except if you are sitting with foreign friends. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. So, so when you come back from a higher education in the U.S., what does when um, nineteen? No, no, no. I mean, oh. so when? <laughs> yes. When you go to other countries where critical thinking is not only practiced but even taught, right. how do you adjust? How do I adjust in Thailand or? Uh, um, well, it's still very difficult, <laughs> obviously. Um, and for example, this kind of conversation could never really happen in, in Thailand. So uh, this is very liberating for me to be here. Um, it's frustrating, uh, but I, now I learn, I've learned to use it to make my work. Um, that helps a little bit, and I've become interested in history, so there is a lot that, that you can read and to, to learn more and more. So I'm slowly learning more and more about my own culture, which I find quite uh, uh, satisfying, um, and it uh, 
I think it makes me feel like when I'm working or doing something, uh, there is uh, something meaningful in that because it is personal, you know, like this film, uh, maybe some people might not find it interesting or attractive, but for me, you know, making it, researching it, thinking about it, personally makes me feel like there is meaning, something meaningful. Like I, when I started out, I just enjoy making art uh, for the sake of it, you know, like drawing just for fun or making shapes and forms. And that's still important for me, but now more and more, maybe because I'm getting older and there's less time <laughs> left, I feel like it's more important for me to do things that I feel that is meaningful for me. So. I think we're going to close down the shop, but with the last question first. So that will be our last question. Yes, thank you for the film. Yes, this is a short question. I was wondering who is talking on the phone? Who, who is, did you think about someone special? Yes, there, there is always, uh, like the Wizard of Oz is always behind the curtain. <laughs> yeah, so it's, you know, wh whoever is more powerful than the guy in, in the room. But the voice is me, by the way, so it's... <laughs> so that tells all. So I'm actually the guy behind the, the curtain. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. I think um, it was a wonderful film. So yes. Congratulations again. Thank you. Thank you. So we wish you all the best for the film. Maybe you'll show the film in festivals or different. I hope. I hope so. Yes. Meetings. Thank you so, so much. Hope you will get awards and <laughs> honors for the film. Thank you so much. And I think no special word from Tash or yourself. So we'll just say good night and good luck. Yes, good night. Yes.